Hi everyone, this is Fashion Knowledge and my name is Bata Vinchuk. I am a Berlin-based critical fashion practitioner and I work across education, research and strategy. I lecture on fashion, design and digital cultures and I run a consultancy and research laboratory called Unfolding Strategies. In each episode, together with my students and fellow researchers and practitioners, we discuss the fashion's most urgent issues and try to reimagine the socially just, sustainable and digital fashion futures. Hi, welcome to Fashion Knowledge. Today I have a pleasure to talk to Harriet Davy, a Berlin-based and Yorkshire-born 3D artist. In her work, she creates virtual models, avatars, that could also be referred to as I don't know, humanoids, but this is Harriet, you will tell us exactly how you refer to them. These digital creatures oftentimes have metallic skin and elf-like ears, and they have been described as shiny, yummy, and alien-like. Today we will dive deeper into these digital bodies she creates. Uh, I was introduced to Harriet and her work a year ago when I was doing a project on digital sustainability and fashion. I was looking for a designer who has experience with digital fashion and Harriet just did a garment for DressX, an online shop where you can buy clothes that only exist as digital files and can be added to your photos. So just like an additional layer in Photoshop. She has also reimagined a garment for Mazel Margiela and is currently an artist in residence at Factory Berlin. What I really appreciate about Harriet, apart from her unique visual language, is her ongoing engagement with the community. She often streams her work process on Twitch, supports younger or less experienced digital creators, and discusses publicly the difficult and problematic aspects of those new digital creations. Some time ago, we had a short Instagram exchange on filters and how they affect us psychologically, physically, and in general, what are their ethical implications? Today, digital fashion is communicated as an alternative to excessive consumption and referred to as sustainable. It is also presented as a domain where plurality and diversity can be celebrated. On the other hand, some digitally enhanced bodies perpetuate body dysmorphia and gave rise to many more plastic surgeries. I would like us to continue this conversation and reflect on today's 3D artist agency, ethics, and how in general 3D art and digital fashion are contributing to one, on one hand, sustainable and diverse fashion futures, and on the other, how neg negatively uh, they affect our body image and reinforce certain beauty standards. So yeah, Harriet, maybe we can start with talking like, actually, how does one create a digital body, a virtual model? Like, how did it start for you? Yeah. Uh, hi. Also, thank you for that intro. That is the best <laughs> intro I've ever yes. heard about myself. <laughs> you should um, send it. We will send it to, to your parents. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be pleased to hear it. Yeah, I mean when you so there's a lot of artists who use a similar technique and softwares to me when they're making physical or well, virtual uh, bodies and that is to use a program called DAS there's a lot of similar programs there's also mm -hmm. character creator by reillusion Adobe had one a while back but it got discontinued there's unreal engines metahuman coming soon so basically you start off with a starting base figure and then there are certain parameters that you can control depending on the software. There's certain things you can add to them, take away, change, morph, shape, et cetera. And then you can also take that model into another program and additionally sculpt on it yourself. You can retexture things. You can, there's a whole crazy workflow and a lot of people are exploring it. And something that's always interesting to me is that these base like these base characters that you start off with depending on the software it's it's so take Daz for instance you have a female or a male character mm -hmm. that you choose and then some aspects are only applicable to one or the other they are like tall skinny white bald interestingly <laughs> as default as well uh and like also these conversations about these parameters is something that I've been quite involved with uh, talking about why this is the standard and the default and why it shouldn't be or why there should be more kind of accessible and freely available changes for these base characters. And how did you get there? How did it happen for you? So what was the tra trajectory like, you know, historically looking at your life? What, what made you do this? Yeah, I mean, I started learning 3D 
three years ago, I think now. Before that, I was I was studying graphic design at the time. Um, before I did graphic design, I did art and I did a lot of painting. I was always really interested in characters and humans and fantasy worlds, like reimagining myself in different worlds. Like as a kid, I was always drawing. I was really obsessed, especially with dragons and was drawing like humans as dragons and all of this stuff. And I think now you look at my work, it's probably quite obvious uh, the sort of stuff I was looking at as a kid. Um, yeah, so I was generally just starting to learn 3D modeling and rendering. I realized I also didn't really like like hard surface modeling. So basically with 3D, there's two types of way that you can model something. There's hard surface and then there's like clay sculpting. And the hard surface is really technical. It's kind of based off making real world machinery and all this stuff. And then there's the clay sculpting, which is much more like having this physical clay in your hands. And so this is the kind of route I went down sort of learning this. And then I found out that there are these programs that you don't need to sculpt all the way from scratch because someone else has made a body from scratch. And so I started playing around with those uh, and just really fell in love with it and and found a workflow that suited me really well and other people liked what I was doing and it just became this feedback loop of me enjoying it, other people enjoying it and yeah. Here we are. Here we okay. are. <laughs> and so what do you what do you say? What words do you use? Do you say that you create humanoids, you make, I don't know, virtual models, digital bodies? Who who are the who are those creatures that you kind of you know create? Yeah, I but think the most common way I use to describe them is like post-human fluid creatures. Because mm -hmm. they're not necessarily like fully human. I always try and have this fluidity to them, whether it's through gender or through some other kind of like cross fluid play i i want to kind of break away from these really binary figures that are the default and how then you understand posthuman i'm just asking because this is like you know a very it's a rather specific terms in certain branches of philosophy we also kind of use it like but like how do you understand it when you call it like this i mean to me it's it's like this um realization of the human figure outside of the real world not that the online or the virtual isn't the real world um it's this mm -hmm. like yeah this virtualization and it's never going to be a true human it's it's always like building off of what was before so it's like this kind of expanding towards this as we said before this digital body yeah exactly okay Okay, that's that's interesting. I really love um, Rosie Braidotti, but she's like this super philosopher, like super philosopher, super intense, and she talks about posthuman condition. And for her, that means actually that you know there are many people who are excluded, there are many representation of the people. Definitely, she celebrates diversity and plurality, but she kind of situates it before, like between digital transformation climate crisis or extinction in other words and cognitive capitalism so she has this kind of uh take on it and uh yeah and kind of try to situate a human or what is a human even becoming today looking at those free forces uh, but definitely the digital part is very very uh, crucial here obviously there are different academic definitions and non-academic definitions but i love the term and i'm always curious to know you know how people use them also the word creatures i think it's excellent and even when you look at people who now do a lot of like crazy makeup and modify their bodies they're also very often say i was fascinated with creatures and creature you know becomes this kind of category but uh so I wanted to 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 ask you if you're talking about those fluid bodies, you also created those fluid bodies can have many roles, right? They can be virtual models, they can be many other things. So how can they function in in the digital realm? Yeah, I mean they can function as a complete replacement for your physical self. Um, you can, for me, like a lot of the practices, kind of instead of exploring my self and my expression and my representation in the real life because I'm really bad at makeup I <laughs> I'm not really crazy about fashion or anything in the in the physical but then I find it's like in the virtual it's it's so much easier for me to explore my own self expression and then there's a lot of that and then 
what else <laughs> i feel like i went full circle i forgot the actual question now yeah no i was i was trying to think so is there are those kind of fluid uh yeah non-binary post-human bodies that kind of are like some extensions of our bodies and they're in digital realm i was wondering you know how if we could make like a classification or different types you know they kind of sometimes i guess have jobs in different roles sometimes they can be as you said the extension of yourself and do other things that you don't do in everyday life or do them differently but I also think, you know, I'm interested in fashion. So I was also wondering, you know, about virtual models. Uh, how does that work? You know, what can be the applications, to put it mm -hmm. simply? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, so you can have a pretty realistic recreation of someone in the virtual who could then act and carry out anything that the physical person would be doing. So you, you can have a musician who's performing live and maybe they have a motion capture suit on and the motion capture is then transferred to a physical a virtual model who is in a virtual world and that can be experienced by people who are not even in the same room they're not at the concert you could have with thinking about virtual fashion everything from wearing the fashion virtually in real time which is coming soon Think. What does it mean? Can you explain it? Because I think, you know, for many people, it might be a very vague concept what it means wearing virtual fashion in real time. Like, what does that mean? Yeah. So imagine the fidelity that we have face filters at. So like they're really responsive. They fit to your face really well. Like it's not really laggy, the kind of tracking technology we have. So imagine if, if, if face filters are virtual makeup, kind of very simply, then we can have very soon like full body application of this. So there can be full body clothes that are seen through either lens of your phone or some kind of augmented reality glasses or some other device, who knows. Uh, soon there will be like the ability to do it for the whole body instead of just the face. Mm -hmm. And what, are, what, are, what is your take on that? What, what would be like, what's exciting about that? What is maybe questionable? What are the pros and cons? Yeah, I mean, it falls, it's just an extenuation, extenuation, extension of all the problems <laughs> that we saw with face filters. So there were a lot of designers making face filters for Instagram and everyone was having a lot of fun and making really fun filters. Uh, and then there started to be this creep of the beauty filter because people were doing really crazy stuff at the beginning, um, like morphing the faces. Like there was this one that it, it said, what animal are you? and then it randomized and then you had like this crazy long drawn out snout and lots of different so there's there's this really fun application of it and then there were the beauty filters that came along and they minimally changed your features they narrowed your nose they tightened your chin your cheekbones raised your eyebrows and now when you're going on instagram that this is what the majority of a lot of the really popular face filters are that we're seeing. So seeing what's happened with face filters, I can only think that with full body ones, like yes, there'll be fashion at first and there'll be really fun applications. And then slowly, if there's the same technology and like we're not really careful, then we're just gonna fall into the same hole and there's gonna be body filters that change your proportions of your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, because this is the also point of the face uh, filter. This is something that I wanted mainly to focus uh, today and discuss with you. So this kind of way how technology is shaping the way we redefine beauty in many ways. Uh, and uh, yeah, social media filters, as you mentioned, you know, today they impose freckles, very swollen lips and spiky chins. I'm particularly a person that has a lot of freckles by default. Uh, naturally, I was born with them. I have quite light green eyes. So actually those two traits that are very often perpetuated by filters, but I'm, and I used to, now I don't in the past have quite big lips. Now I don't have big lips because now it became limitless. But when I see, for example, when the face filter kind of suggests what I should look like, that actually my lips are becoming very swollen and round. My freckles multiply like clip crazy. And I get this, you know, very, uh, and realistic for me, super, super light green color. So it's fascinating to even see that something that, you know, I have in my body 
is enhanced to such a crazy extent and creates that look. But I've came across, uh, I came across a while ago, at, like I discovered this extreme example. It's a, an Australian startup called Quoves, and they use this AI to tell people how they can improve their beauty and, you know, quote, identify problem areas. So how it works is that people can upload their photo. So you send your photo, you're like, oh, I'm Harriet. This is my photo. This is how I look like without makeup and natural daylight. And you receive a report. And on their website, I didn't do it. I don't think you can do it anymore for free, but I think in the past there was an option like that. But on their website, they give like this example of such report and there's this following description. This subject has a soft juvenile feminine face. Her face shows considerable proportion and harmony for the most part, although there are some regions that could benefit from cosmetic changes and will make it stand out. That being said, aside from a, new a few deviations, it's really the word is deviations that can be corrected. The subject is considerably blessed to have a coinophilic face. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, so, so yeah, obviously this is very problematic, but I'm, yeah, and I'm wondering if actually, you know, if not the filters, probably filters created a demand for such services and products, because I was thinking, you know, where are we to have like, you know, this, uh, very in the end, it's very basic AI assessment of, of a face and its features and like, look going for perfect symmetry that does not exist as we know uh so i was i was curious yeah how and i know that you uh used to create filters and uh, you said that uh, you were you know you are you were interested in that how do you think it kind of led us to this i mean the filters like these problems didn't arise at the same time that filters arose and at the end of the day uh a lot of filter creators were just like creating what's popular and what's popular is what has always been popular in the past, <laughs> which is whatever the standard of beauty is at a given time. And I, I actually was just wondering in, in some ways, like maybe people being able to play around with their appearance in a completely non-permanent and non-physical way might not be so so harmful, you know, for someone who wants to try out how their face would appear if certain changes were made because it's always been crazy to me that people surgically and permanently alter their appearance for beauty trends that are inevitably like transient and always changing and they every 20 years the the beauty standard is completely different uh but i mean like going back to this ai face reading thing i also remember when i was i don't know like 14 before this was like actually I remember this phone app that or even like a iPod app that you would like take a photo of your face and it would scan it and it would say how attractive you were and everyone was using it and it was just random it was completely random it would give you a number out of 10 and it would pretend it was analyzing symmetry but literally the technology couldn't even do that on a phone back then and people were obsessed with it and I I don't know how we change like what is going wrong here like in forms of like the whole of society like how we feel such a draw to to things like this and face filters are maybe just the most obvious way of showing like this really deep rooted problem that we have in society anyway mm, with like self-image and beauty and actually willingness to be assessed and to kind of reconfirm that we we are worthy of a term beautiful maybe that's yeah. the that's the case well i also when you mentioned the you know the kind of full body filters i'm also intrigued if it's not going to be like what's the perfect you know wrist what's the perfect hand this kind of aim for enhancement and perfection that it's gonna that it's gonna perpetuate but you know another thing is this as i mentioned in the beginning this kind of on one hand so we have those negative aspects of either filters because also digital digital uh, body representations also contribute that because they kind of you know propose certain different standards i know many people who have uh, their avatars their digital representations they don't they, they don't necessarily look like them even though these are like the hyper realistic ones so i'm always intrigued you know what is the line if i were to have my you know uh like a like a digital version of myself what should i be blonde should i be skinnier should i be more fat should i be a different person i know that you're working now on kind of yeah uh doing that for some people so maybe yeah you could tell us a little bit about it what is it like to capture a person and like you know what are the parameters where do you 
how do you how do you navigate that mm, yeah I mean I get given reference photos of real people to be used for their virtual characters and I'm like how many of like perceived flaws do I include like they have a scar on their face they have spots freckles like how much of that do I include I always try and and stay as as truthful as I can and like as limited in like the skills I have as well like right now with uh this musician that I'm working with who is this Inuit throat singer from Canada she doesn't like to be photographed in real life so she wants this virtual version of herself to be a complete replacement and they are like completely wanting a really accurate portrayal she has quite deep uh, like cheek creases which is quite unusual actually and a lot of people would try and gloss over that but they came back with more feedback and they were like yeah we really want to accentuate them and like don't make her look any younger than she looks because there's no point and they I really love that and I've, I've had some other stuff like I've had some other clients where I was showing them the figure and the figure had no clothes on and they were like oh we can't show this to the the person that's of like without covering up uh this virtual body which was also kind of really funny because I'm so used to just seeing this like t-pose really neutral human uh mm -hmm. all the time that I just didn't even think that them like seeing it nude shirtless was was even a like a, a problem okay. but yes, yeah <laughs> um and yeah, like digital, seeing it, digital nudity yeah I mean my I'm always kind of careful about the Instagram algorithm when I'm posting my stuff because sometimes it's a bit on the edge and when it looks hyper real I think Instagram even though it says art is fine for well, like the, female you know, nudity but even the the, the Venus uh the Venus the one of the you know oldest of the oldest statues so this kind of very very voluptuous venus statue uh that was also considered uh i don't know porn or inappropriate for instagram at some point so yeah i think everything can fit this category of, the, of this particular example does but but yeah but like talking about this kind of yeah nudity and what what are what do you think like how do you think that you affect people with your work do you ever think about that like what's kind of your agency like what's what you're kind of putting out in the world if filters affect people in a certain way do you think that's uh, about your work yeah i mean i think it's impossible to put something out without affecting someone in some way like i don't want my i would never want it to negatively affect someone i would i would only ever want someone to look at my work and kind of see new possibilities or even if they just see it and it's something nice to look at that's also I think relevant uh, mm -hmm. and even for a long time I was making a lot of work and like similar to the work I make now and I wasn't really thinking about why I was making it in particular until people started asking me and then I realized there were, there, that there were a lot of reasons I'm just not a particularly introspective or philosophical person really um but natural uh yeah so I think that I also want to to try and inspire younger people like that's a massive part of my practice is to really inspire anyone who might not be even sure that they that they want to follow an art practice like this but if someone saw it and then was inspired to to make 3d or to even paint or anything like that that would also be really really rewarding hmm. yeah that's 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 beautiful i I'm, I'm certain that your work does that uh but as you said in the beginning you say that you also want to challenge those kind of default bold settings those default kind of binary setup so is that how do you how do you embrace that in your work how yeah, is that yeah how is that the part of that i mean one like the main the main way is probably that i really love to subvert a male like I start off with a male base and then try and make it as feminine as possible uh, and then the opposite with the female base I really love these like really strong quite toned but like really still quite feminine figures and like the way that a lot of the curves like catch the light in in the 3d like lighting is the best thing <laughs> when you're working in 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 3d softwares um but I'm always trying to like mix and kind of hack bits of the softwares to try and to try and like apply these bit these assets and 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 parts and body parts that shouldn't 
that shouldn't fit together. And do you think it's possible? Because it, it, it's, it's striking to me how very binary and how mask and femme divide are, are those kind of programs that you use. Do you think in future there will be kind of like a, you know, a non-binary, uh, as you're using your words, post-human fluid kind of way of designing that it won't be by default male or female or both? I hope so, yeah. I think maybe, I mean, it's funny with Daz because in Daz, so Daz are on their like eighth generation uh, model and their first generation model, you didn't start off with a male or female, you started off just with a basic kind of middle human and then you could use sliders that would give it more femme or mask attributes. And they've actually gone backwards, you know, since then. Um, hmm. So like the readaption of this kind of I think sliders work really well for a lot of attributes instead of just so meta human that Unreal have, have produced. Like they have a lot of these, you can drag bits of the face around and it, and it really morphs between different shapes really fluidly. And like they're not necessarily labeled um, as more mask or feminine names. Uh, so I think <laughs> when developers are designing these programs like the name even the name of a certain parameter is really important to either make people think or not have to think about these things mm -hmm. yeah that's that's definitely interesting and how do you think is reflected because my, my biggest concern is always with you know digital fashion and in general creative industries going in many ways digital because this is the let's say the field that you work in right because you work with music industry you work with you work with fashion brands you work in different capacities kind of you know uh mm -hmm. using your tools and your work to to be inserted into that into this context um how do you think because so what i wanted to say is that i very often struggle with this idea that we feel like we have some kind of new territory and it's exciting and it's going to be you know about diversity and sustainability and this is these are those claims of sustainable fashion but in the end i'm always afraid that we'll actually repeat swallow and reuse exactly the same problems and issues that we had so far which are very much rooted in whatever examples of social injustice that fashion produces you know could be so do you what do you how do you imagine you know how how in your eyes uh, fashion industry and creative industries uh, will be changing. Are you more optimistic than me or? I think so. I think that up and coming Gen Z is like, to me, the most exciting generation possibly that we've seen in a while of like just visible activism, visible diversity. Um, I think the the more diverse people who, like even when I was a kid, I don't think there were any I had I knew a few artists and stuff, and I, I could never have named a female artist even up until like two years ago. I barely knew any female three D artists, and now I know like three hundred through Digigal. Um, so like the more that we that we branch together, like communities like Digigal. I'll explain Digigal for anyone who doesn't know. It's a community of women, trans, intersex, and non-binary three D artists, designers, a lot of fashion designers who are doing three D work, and yeah, there's about 300 of us or so uh, and like having these pockets of communities who all support each other um, like there's people now there's a few members of Digigal who are like in their 40s and they are running studios and 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 then they're offering jobs to people lower down and then not lower down like younger people um, and then sometimes I have extra work that I can then pass on to another Digigal and if I didn't have this community then maybe those trickle down jobs would have gone to just another white cis bro, you know? Um, so yeah, I think I am optimistic. Uh, and I think that the future, the future is fluid and the future is coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, this is pretty good. Uh, I think ending to our conversation, my last question then would be, because this is something you said you're interested in yourself, like what would be your advice for, you know, uh, young or not only young people interested in becoming free artists doing things like you do yeah I think the first the first advice is like try and find artists that look like you try and find uh, role models to look up to who aren't the norm um, I also had never watched a tutorial by someone who wasn't a white man until about six months ago 
So I'm also like trying to put out tutorials as well. So try and find and learn and look up to people that are reflections of yourself and and also don't be afraid to reach out to them. Like people are a lot friendlier than they appear <laughs> on the internet. Um, if you fit into the category of Digigal, if you're woman, trans, intersex, non-binary, like send us a message on the Digigal Instagram and we'd be happy to have you. Great, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Harriet. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for having me.